You're listening to Got Tech, the podcast with your hosts, Eric Geis and Nick Johnson. Welcome back to Got Tech, the podcast. This is episode 91 called Seven Easy Steps to Start a Student Podcasting Class. In this episode, we'll talk about why you should start a student podcasting class at your school, followed by an in-depth look at seven easy steps you can follow to get started right now. This is another episode you don't want to miss. Check it out. Back with episode 91. I'm super pumped to be doing this. This is right before I go on vacation. I think, Nick, you're going on vacation soon as well? Yep, that's right. I'm leaving in three three days this Saturday. You're leaving tomorrow, I believe, right? Or the next day? Tomorrow it is. Yes, I get to go camping. I'm going to leave all tech things behind. So we decided that we had to sit down and record this one on a Wednesday. I'm, I'm super pumped to do it because it's one of my favorite topics in education right now. And it's it's still keeping with our theme of students being content creators. So I'm very happy to do this episode. Yeah, we were kind of toying around with doing like a maybe this may happen and may not, but we'll see sort of like a series of episodes in like a how to theme. So how to start a student podcasting class is essentially what this will be. And you might see this followed up here and there with other how to's just to a way to sort of jumpstart something that you might want to do in your school or with your students centered around various themes. And today, like I just said, is is one of our favorite topics, of course, podcasting, in particular, student podcasting. To kick it off, I've always kind of wondered about some of these statistics surrounding podcasts, because to me, they're a big deal, obviously, because we have one and, and we do a lot of this stuff with our students already. So a lot of my time is spent thinking about and talking about podcasts. But I was always kind of curious, like, what is it what is it like for a regular person? Do they care as much as we care? So I found some actual stats that I wanted to share uh, with you, sir, and with the listeners here today. These are courtesy of a website called firstsiteguide.com. I don't know how accurate they are other than to say they were updated recently and they seem pretty legit. I cross-checked them with a couple other sources too. Um, so let's we're just going to go with them and see how that works. Do you want me to rattle a couple of these off right now? Yeah, I feel like you should be giving me two truths and then I pick out the <laughs> lie or whatever. But I think I we could just rattle these off. Yeah, I thought about trying to set that up, but I just didn't have time. So uh, here's, here's the, the one I was most interested in is how many podcasts are there? This guy says there are more than 1 million individual podcasts. And I was looking around to cross check that. Uh, some sources say it as high as 2 million, which doesn't totally disagree with what he said. But that's a ridiculous number. If you just think about that, 1 million unique individual podcasts. Now, a lot of those are not active. I think um, another one of the stats I read said that only 30% somewhere around 30% of people who start a podcast actually keep doing it for longer than three years. So of that 1 million, you can really trim it down to a much smaller percentage that we're about to become a part of actually pretty soon, a, a much smaller percentage actually keep doing it. So a lot of these are sort of uh, one and done type things, but more than 1 million podcasts. 78.9 million people in the United States will watch podcasts or will listen to podcasts. 104 million people listen uh, monthly in the United States. That's a lot. This one I found interesting. 66% of consumers today prefer podcasts over television. I don't know if you you and your family do this, but sometimes I will choose. Me and my wife will pick a podcast and, and listen to it together rather than watching TV. Have you guys ever done that? I listen to podcasts all the time. Yeah. I think my wife rather read or have an audio book open. Right. Right. But I think she would also prefer TV over podcasts as well. So we've got uh, just a couple more here. 79% of people listen while commuting. Obviously, that's what I do. I know that's what you do. That's what I think most people do to listen to these shows. 65% are listened to on a mobile device. And this one's cool. Ad revenue 
is forecasted to exceed $1 billion. I know that's why a lot of people get into this. They think if uh, they can get enough listeners, you might make some money off of ad revenue, which is true for a lot of people. And I think that's my last stat. So I find that super fascinating. And I like that because it emphasizes to me why they matter and then why you might be able to convince your students that they matter too as you build podcasts into a class or what we hopefully get you to do after this episode is start an entire course built around student podcasting. That is the class, a student podcasting class. And that's what we're going to talk about and tell you how to do. We have a couple of resources to share though, guys. I don't know if you want to get into those. Yeah. I mean, these resources are near and dear to, you know, us because one, we're the, you know, directly, I wrote the one, and then the other <laughs> one, we kind of team, we, we team wrote. So, uh, so the first resource is uh, hvspn.com. This is one that you and I both did. This is our school website page where students uh, can have a landing page for their podcast or blog or vlog or YouTube channel. So they'll play all their videos there. So this is one that if you want to just look at the podcasting or if you just want to look at the blog, you could get a student example of what they may look like. And I think that they're pretty awesome. The students did a great job. Their their buy-in is tremendous. Uh, Their effort is above and beyond anything that Nick and I thought that we would get out of them. Uh, The other resource is if you just want to pick up an educational podcast, and you want to start listening to some of those, you can learn how to interview people. Uh, You can learn how to, you know, you can show your students good conversationalists or interviewers. Uh, Kelly Croy is amazing at interviewing people. You have uh, a different type of interview with Tim Cavey and Teachers on Fire. So it's a list of over 30 different educational podcasts. You might want to take a look at them, but also your students could look at them and and pick out what parts of those podcasts do they really like. So uh, on HVSPN, you could also find student podcasting. So there's there's two different types of podcasts there that you could get a hold of. A third resource that we are going to base uh, segment two off of is called the Teacher's Guide to Student Podcasting 2.0. And this is another one that Nick and I co-wrote together as we are starting our podcasting course this fall. You can follow Got Tech outside the podcast at gottech.com or on Twitter at we got Tech. Yeah, so those are the resources we've got. And I also thought it would be good to start off and, and talk about why would somebody do this, right? It's a lot of work starting an entirely new course. Anybody who's ever done that knows that's the deal. Um, so why would you want to do this uh, centered around podcasting? So I'm going to do the first couple of these because uh, they're kind of all related to me. And that kind of starts off with number one, student engagement student buy-in in in making learning real for students. This is an entirely project-based course. The project being you come in, you sit down, we show you how to, you know, hopefully put together a decent podcast and record it, edit it, publish it. And you can imagine the engagement that goes along with that, the buy-in that goes along with that, especially because really what the students end up working on are little miniature passion projects where they get to decide, I'm going to start a podcast on X, whatever they're interested in. They get to learn about it deeply, talk about it, share that research, share their love of that thing. And and of course, the engagement and the buy-in goes along with that. And it's going to be really super high. They're going to be learning stuff. You know, it may not be necessarily always super content driven. And that's great, I think. Uh, But whatever they're learning, it's going to be very real to them because they know It's part of this podcast and it's going out there for the world to listen to. If that's how you choose to publish these episodes, the world can access them. And and that makes it very real to them and it makes them want to do a good job. And they know maybe even 50 years down the line when they have an entire life to look back on, they might be able to still search and listen to their 16-year-old selves or their 7-year-old selves and find that podcast episode and what a trip that would be. So those first three are some of my favorite ones. And I, and I think some of the most important ones too. Yeah. I mean, I know 
of people as young as seven podcasting. I think uh, Chris Nessie's son, who is under 10, it has a podcast, and I believe this is his second or third podcast. He did a podcast on vacuums at one point, and now I think he's doing like a joke of the week uh, podcast. So really any grade level, uh, you would be able to pull this off in. It could just be your first grade class podcast where you just, every Monday you record your students saying, hey, this is what I'm thankful for over the over the weekend, or this is what I did that summer, and you publish the episode so the parents can hear, you know, a little bit about the classmates in there, or maybe something they learned from that week. It could be a reflection piece on Friday. So it could work for any grade level. You could use these as alternative assessments. When you use a, a podcast as an assessment, a lot of students that we've worked with say that the content sticks with them for a lot longer because they have to know the content better. They have to understand it. They have to be able to dive in, go a little bit deeper and have a conversation about it. So it has to make more sense than what they may study or get out of a multiple choice question or the loads and loads of fluff that you may get in a short narrative or an essay. Uh, you talked a little bit already about real world skills, being able to be out in the real world and already understand how editing audio and understanding that these podcasting skills that you learn in the classroom can be used to promote your own uh, lawn care business or your pool business. Or if you wanted to start one to get prospective clients because you're a stockbroker or something like that, you could start a podcast for that. So this these skills can be really used out in the real world and in education, and it could all be driven by student interest and passion. So it gives uh, students a sense of voice and choice. And that's probably the number one thing I really like about podcasts is you really get to understand how each student works, what interests them, and how they can tie course content with their own personal interests and make it work out. I think that means that it's time to get into the real meat of the show, which is how do you go about doing this? And the process of starting a podcasting class pretty closely follows this guide that we mentioned earlier. So I think that's um, if, if you like what you're hearing today, definitely head to the show notes. We've got it linked there so you can easily pull up a copy of the guide yourself as we start to essentially skim the sections there for you guys now. Guys, do you, can I kick it over to you to start off the, the podcasting guide? Yeah, before we get into the seven easy steps of starting your own uh, podcast or your students starting their own podcast, you really have to figure out why you're doing it. What is the purpose behind it? What definition of podcast are you using? A podcast can simply be any recorded audio. Uh, that's probably the simplest definition of it. And it could be as complex as a digital auto file meant for downloading to a computer and operated through an RSS feed. And a lot of you are going to be like, what the heck is all this? So an RSS feed basically is just your unique feed to your podcast that allows people to subscribe. Think Apple. Uh, podcast here. They click subscribe to your RSS feed. So every time a new episode comes out. Now in education, that's taking it, you know, really to the third degree here, because you could easily just have it as a Google file in a folder where other students in your class can play it. And that's all the further it goes. You could have it even simpler than that. You could have it just as a file that gets turned into the teacher. And then there's a grade there if you want to. Or you could have this class experience where you put it on a Google site and, and uh, students can go and they could click on each individual episode, provide feedback, have discussions, and make it more interactive. And the last one is really just going out and making it a full-fledged podcast, kind of like what God Tech is right now. So you got to figure out which one you're comfortable with. I would advise you to start small, maybe do a single experience, see if you really like it, see if your students really like it, 
And if they do, then then maybe work your way up to the classroom experience. But the cool thing about this is once you have it recorded, edited, and published ready, you can go and publish those later on if you really want to make that full-fledged podcast experience. Yeah, so I, I like that you pointed that out first because you really do have to decide the purpose of your, you know, whatever version of the podcast thing that you're about to do is. Uh, if you are going to be posting these out there uh, using that RSS feed, you got to make sure that your school is okay with that. So, of course, you want to talk to the highest level admin you possibly can so that they are clear on that and that the proper permissions are in place for the students' uh, safety as well because their voices are going to be out there uh, covering things like, are they going to be allowed to say their real names? Just just all those little details you really want to make sure are hammered out. Uh, as you're sort of thinking about the purpose of this class and and going along with that, of course, are talking to all the right people and getting the permissions to actually start this class. Once you've done that, you can get into what is officially our our step one of putting together a student podcast. These steps aren't, you need to have all seven. It's not like that. Depending on how in-depth you're going to go in with podcasting, you may only need four or five of them, all right? Some of, we, we put these seven steps in there and to cover the simplest form of podcasting and the more complex version of podcasting, like what, what we do every two weeks. All right, so let's go ahead and get into step one. Step one is planning. So in our uh, Teacher's Guide to Student Podcasting 2.0, we have a hyperlink that takes you to the Student Podcast Planning Guide. And what this is going to do is it's going to break down planning of a podcast into eight categories. And these categories range from selecting a podcast title, an episode title, and some general topics that you want to include in your show, some general questions to be answered during the episode, especially if you have some type of interviewer or interviewee. You want to have an idea of your targeted length. I always tell my students uh, the short one should be five minutes and the average commute of a person. So if they, they are choosing a podcast that they think people of the working age would enjoy, I would choose to go 15 to 20 minutes because the average commute, especially where we are, is 18 minutes. So that's a perfect length for a podcast. Then after that, you would also plan out some of the segments and segmentations of everything. You would assign roles to the different students. Now, I know this sounds like we're going over a lot in a little bit of time. We are, but the guide will literally guide you along the way so you can check out the guide. The third category of the eight is inter- our interviews. Who you're going to interview? What's that going to look like? Is it more of a conversation? Is it a bunch of Q&A? Uh, next up are your segments. Uh, Nick and I typically do three segments. Sometimes we kick in an extra segment, but it's an introductory segment. It's uh, the meat potatoes and then at the end we either play a game or something like that so usually we have three segments per episode Uh, they could pre-plan those because you know keeping some consistency is always good after that the fifth category is audio so what what audio are you going to use for your intros and your outro music? So at the beginning of our podcast, we have a certain selection of music that we do. And at the end, we have it as well. Category six is the introduction. So we have our students always come up with an introduction that is pretty consistent. You're listening to Yada Yada Podcast. This is episode number blank. And today we're going to cover this, this, and that. All right, we do the same thing in our our episode, uh, then you're gonna have the conclusion. This is another uh, main part of the planning. At the end, are you gonna have the Bob Barker, please make sure you go out and spay and neuter your pets at the end of every episode? How are you gonna end it? And then the last category is, all right, now that we have all these different parts, Let's make an outline and let's get ready to record. Yeah, that was great, man. I mean, there's a ton of stuff in there, um, but really that what we just went through, that will guide your students through the process of planning a podcast. And you're going to want to build that into to your course as well, because uh, it's 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 all done for you, ready to roll. Um, I'll add too that the like the intro and the conclusion stuff, you want to probably standardize those in some way, at least parts of it. And your school administration might have certain things that 
they want the students to say. I think we have a little statement at the beginning that the something like the views of the hosts do not necessarily represent the views of the school district. Whether or not your school is going to ask you to do that, it's up to them. But it's always a good idea to check on all that stuff as you uh, sort of get into this this planning phase of how your students will actually put together their show following roughly that outline. Right. And just to go along with that, yeah, we encourage our students to have their own views and everything, but we also have some checks and balances of making sure that the content that they produce is acceptable. It's, you know, it's quality content. It's not fake news. It's not a bunch of gossip and it's not putting any, any groups down. Uh, so we have all these fundamentals that we, uh, concepts that we want to make sure that are there and present and that it, it stays with the high standards that we set for the podcast without limiting, I guess, their sense of control over their own podcasts. Uh, I think that's the best way of putting it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And um, you're going to have to decide how to do that. We have almost, um, you could call them like teacher hosts or um, you can tell me if there's an official name here, but some other teacher that the students have to find that is willing to listen to each episode in full uh, because for our students in our podcasting class, there's just no way we could listen to every single one of them. It would be our entire lives devoted to this. So we kind of spread that out and put that on the students to find someone that they trust and someone that we trust, a faculty member, to verify and say, yes, this is school appropriate you can post this on, you know, as part of uh, the school episode. So there's a ton of stuff to explore there. Um, we'll leave it at that for now as we get into step two, which is super important and all about equipment. If you're going to have a student podcast or if you're going to start an entire class, you're going to need to direct the kids on how they're going to actually do the recording. And I think this is probably the most intimidating part for people um, trust the guide, everybody. We've got it all listed out for you. Some of the easy ways up to some of the complex ways to do this. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, if they've got phones, which most kids do now, you can record right into a built in audio recording app straight in the phone. And that audio can be sent places. You can email it or text it where it can then be edited. So it's something as simple as a mobile device it is all you might need to record an episode. If your school, as many do now, especially in a post-COVID world, provides Chromebooks to the students, they can record right into their computers. That Chromebook has a microphone. Quality's not great, but it's fine, and it's going to put together a decent podcast. So there's extensions that record audio. If you just Google some of those, you'll find them. There's websites um, like Sotophonic that can record audio which can then be sent out and edited and then posted somewhere. If you want to get really fancy and you've got maybe a budget for this, maybe somebody has approved uh, some money to throw your way, you can buy external microphones. A lot of them just plug in via a USB right into that Chromebook or whatever desktop or device the students have, um, and then you can record that way. The benefit of this is it feels a little bit more real to the kids. They've got a nice mic sitting in front of them, and the audio <coughs> quality is going to increase uh, if you're wondering what microphones we like, you can head to step two in the uh, in the guide we're referencing here, where we've got a bunch of them listed out uh, from low price to high price. I think that's how it's arranged in in links to to those mics and and where to buy them. So to kind of make some of that work a little bit easier for you. This is always your area of expertise, man. The equipment. Did I cover everything correctly? Do you think? Yeah. The only thing I want to add there is the. The four or five mics that we included in this guide are the four or five mics that we've used throughout this process. Uh, I know both of us, we started back uh, three years ago, a little over three years ago, with just uh, our computers and headphones with the mic on it. And that was it. And then we kind of graduated to the Snowball uh, mic, which are, you know, before COVID, they were about 50 bucks. During COVID, they were about 85 um, because they were in high demand. And then after that, we went to the Yeti microphone, which I'm actually using right now because we're in the middle of moving and it's small and portable and easy to, to move around. Uh, and this is a great quality microphone. And I, I love this uh, because it's, it's a, a USB microphone that I can plug right into my computer and it gives me 
many different settings, such as unidirectional, so that's me talking into it. It's not picking up anything else from the room. Hopefully you can't hear my three kids upstairs kicking and screaming right now. It looks, it sounds like they're having a Royal Rumble. So I don't know if you hear that, but I definitely do. I can make it two directional, which will pick up both sides of the table, or I can make it omnidirectional, which is more like if you have a chorus, that'd be cool if we had a chorus in the background singing during one of our podcasts, I could, uh, I could set it on that mode, but it's relatively inexpensive, about a hundred bucks. After that, uh, we got into the, Hyo 40s, Hyo PR 40s. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different tech equipment now that has two two letters and two numbers at the end, so I, I confuse them all. But that's what we typically use when we record podcasts now, especially when we're in person. So I, I, I will tell you that there's there's a little sound quality difference between earbuds with the microphone and the snowball mic the snowball mic and the Yeti mic. And then there's a bigger difference in audio quality between the Yeti and the Heil PR40. So that was step two. It's all about the equipment. My recommendation there is to stay simple, stay very cost effective until you know that you have buy-in and that you really like to go through this process. It is a process. Uh, A lot of times, if you get really good at step three and step four, The process is very simple. Step three is recording. Step four is editing. We have a whole bunch of different ed tech tools that will allow you to record or edit. Some of the simple ones are with, uh, they're just URL based, is uh, Vocaroo. Uh, Nick already mentioned Sodaphonic. You can just record in both of those. The one reason why I like Sodaphonic better is you could edit that same piece of audio in there it doesn't have all the crazy tools like editing tools within that software it just has the ones that you kind of need to keep it short sweet and simple when you when you edit Uh, so that's soda phonic the one that nick and i use if you have uh, desktops ipads or uh, apple mac macbooks or anything like that you could use audacity it's a free download it's an amazing program you could record and edit in there as well If you want a one-stop shop for podcasting, you could go to Anchor, but just note that they will use your content and they will uh, put commercials, I believe, in your content. I might be wrong. It's been a while since I checked them out, but, you know, I have nothing against Anchor. I think it's a great cost-effective way of sharing your content. I've heard of people using GarageBand, Soundtrap, Beautiful Audio Editor, and Twisted Wave. Those are a couple other ones. And then if you want to get into more of the remote interviews where you have guests, you can use Zencaster, Skype, Zoom, uh, StreamYard, anything that you could get an audio feed from and download that audio, you could get that there. And then the two other tools that we use, especially if you're recording very small audio tracks that you could put in a playlist, you could use a uh, tool called synth and then if you want to create some if you want to take some of your audio and make little commercials out of them you could use a tool called headliner but if you get really good at recording without a bunch of distractor words such as and um but like and all this dead space and things like that you can easily get away with using an easier tool And I think that's really where you want to get to is develop a good podcasting strategy. Make sure that your students know that it's a lot easier to edit space, like just quiet space within a podcast to recollect your thoughts than to put a, what I call a connector in there, which is your, um, but like those are very hard to edit out and it's very time consuming. It's very easy to see that there's blank space there and to trim that up. Yeah. So, I mean, we're starting to get now into, you know, besides just choosing some of these tools to use, like maybe you want to use Sodaphonic as your recording and editing tool. Fine. That's a decision you got to make. Maybe you want that one-stop shop experience that does it all. So you're, you're going to be using Anchor. Fine. You have to sort of decide that, play around with a couple of these. We have some recommend recommendations uh, in the guide beneath steps three and four. So you can check those out. 
Um, but you will have to do this with your kids. Talk to them about what a good podcast sounds like. Not doing what I just did, which is say, um, now some ums are okay. It's part of natural speech. It's fine. But if they're saying, um, every other word, it's a lot of editing and it's not going to sound good. And it's going to take way too long. So you need to just sort of train them to pay attention to your ums. Try and turn those ums into pauses that are easier to listen to. And if you're going to edit that, they're easier to edit out also. Just little tips like that, avoiding the word like, some of these common things that we do with our speech. I would maybe even build in some time at the start of the your class to have the kids do a, a mock recording where they just listen to themselves talk. When you listen to yourself talk, you learn a lot about the way you talk, whether it's fast or slow, things that you do when you're nervous or when you feel like you're messing up. You want to start to train them on catching all that and improving it so they speak as clearly as possible and just letting them know that, you know, this recording is a process. We're, we're almost three years in here, I think, and I'm still making changes to the way I talk. I'm sure you're the same way. And for them, they have, they're doing it on an even shorter timeline. So that's going to be a big part of this. Yeah, I know for a fact that I lose a lot of my dynamic through podcasting. I know I'm monotone. I know I speak at, in a certain low range. So a lot of times when I te teach, I have to be a little goofy. And that goofiness doesn't show on a podcast. So what I do sometimes is I just make my voice go up a little bit <laughs> to show that, hey, Nick, I'm with you. But I had to learn that through podcasting. Although if you go back to episode one, and I'm not saying that you should or you shouldn't, you need to fall asleep. I might yeah. do that. You know, now I'm, now I'm a little bit more uppy. I feel like uh, listening to you all the time. I speak a little bit fast. I know not much, but a little bit. But, you know, we, we just got done with our first four steps. So we already recorded. We edited. Now we have to get into publishing. So this is where you get to make a decision whether you want to publish through an RSS feed. Do you want to put a just a screen image on a YouTube uh, video? So you have an MP3, which is your audio, and you add an image to it. So that makes it an MP4. You just could publish your episodes on YouTube. That's a very cheap, effective way of getting students to buy in because they, they like to go see how many times that video has been watched. And you can get that in the analytics of YouTube. You could also publish these videos onto a Google site if you want to take the professionalism up just one more step. Or you can go to uh, several different hosting sites and you can publish your audio there, every episode there, such as Anchor, Libsyn, uh, we use podcast websites. We we love that one. So you can put them there, and then what they'll do is push them out to all the the uh, podcasting players. And that's the easiest way to do that on a small scale. Just use YouTube or a Google site on a larger scale. Find a hosting site. Anchor is free. Got to be careful with the commercials, though. Make sure that they're school appropriate, I guess. And uh, make sure that they follow the the norms of the school or, or the guidelines of your school. Or if you want to pay a certain fee each month, you can get Libsyn or podcast websites. Or I guess, really, it's Captivate now. Captivate's another fantastic one. And uh, you can you can send your podcast out to the masses that way. Yeah, so we will just talk about our experience really quick. If you are really doing this and you're going to have a bunch of different student podcasts, uh, we use something called Podcast Websites, um, which works with another service called Captivate. Uh, this is a great way to do it if you really want to go in big and have a website to go along with your podcast because a lot of po real podcasts have a website as part of it. Um, so this is like, I don't want to say the most extreme version you can go but it's going to be up there they will set you up with websites they can even design it for you uh, they will set you up with that rss feed so people can subscribe and these student recordings when they are uploaded and published to that website get pushed out to all your major podcast players i like this because the students like it and they get pretty pumped that their stuff is going to then be on Apple and Spotify and all of these places that they can see. If that's intimidating to you, 
remember that you can just publish the audio as a YouTube video within it, a still image in the background. Uh, that's fine. It's still out there. It's still real. You could even go even simpler, I guess, and just have, you know, MP3 audio files that are in a Google Drive somewhere. And you can put links maybe to those Google Drive files on, say, a Google site so people can still listen to them. Um, but I think it is super important that the kids know in some way that their audio is available because if they just think they're recording something that only you will listen to and nobody else, and it, uh, to me, it kind of falls flat and it just becomes like another school project that just they do and then it dies never to be seen again. So I, I think that's really going to help with the, the buy-in piece there as part of this whole, this whole step. So that's, that's publishing. Um, as we come into the final couple steps here, you know, we just finished the part that is the podcast. The rest of this is all just sort of icing on the cake, real world skills. Um, step six, in fact, is uh, we titled it cover art and episode art, because if you are posting a real podcast, you need that. You need some type, some type of logo on your episode art. Um, or your cover art. And then each episode has a little image that's going to get posted most likely either on the website for that episode, or if you're doing the, say the YouTube video version, then that YouTube video does need an image, a still image as the background. And that image is probably going to be the episode art. So the kids ideally will be designing this themselves. And that's going to be a later part of your course. Once they've got the recording and editing down they're, and they're starting to pump out episodes, you can then get into the, the graphics part of this, which is another really cool tie in for a lot of your kids that like to do that. We do a lot of this design uh, using tools that make it easy. Uh, your kids are not going to be graphic design trained. Uh, you may not be graphic design trained. So this is, uh, you know, we're really trying to make this easy for them. So tools like Canva for education, make it so simple. They have a lot of templates there where you can get quality, quality stuff with almost no time and effort. If you don't want to do that, it's something that you probably already have access to like Google Slides or Google Drawings. They can play around in there too and and, and build some of this digital stuff. But I really want to push these uh, Canva for education. I think it's probably the best way to, way to go. And a, and a lot of it can be done using the free version as well. So I think that's, uh, that's super important to know. Yeah, that's more of up your alley, I think uh, you're the you're the graphically creative one. Um, I'm passable now, uh, probably at best, but uh, you do a real nice job with our graphics. Uh, you do a nice job teaching our students how to make graphics. Uh, I know that you just had your students make a podcast at the end of the year, and I know that they came up with some pretty awesome uh, graphics as well. So. Another thing when you want to keep in mind when you're making all these graphics is usually these images take up a lot of space. Like you need to compress them. You need to make that file size smaller. So when it's on a website that it comes up quicker. One uh, website that you could go to is www.tinypng.com. And what that's going to do is compress your, your image. So you upload it, it will compress it, and then you'll download it as a smaller file. Uh, it's a very quick process to do, and that's going to wrap up the sixth step. And finally, we're going to get into our last step, which is digital marketing. So a lot of people, I find, a lot of teachers shy away from using social media in your classrooms because it could get students into trouble. And this is a debate that I've had over and over and over with people. And yes, social media, especially teaching, when you use it in the teaching er arena here, it could be very daunting and it could be very scary because if your student does one thing, messes up on social media, it can be a real, real tough lesson. Me personally, i rather them mess up one time as a 17 year old than, you know, later on where it's going to cost them a job or something like that down the line. But the, the key to this is, is making sure they understand what it means to be a good digital citizen. Uh, that they're putting stuff on there, they're reading it, they're rereading it, they're making sure that there's nothing confrontational there. If you're not confrontational in your social media, you're not putting anyone down, and you're staying positive, it's very hard to go wrong. 
But once again, just like we do in our podcast where we have a, a, a podcast advisor, if you will, it's like a club advisor, look over everything. They're also going to look over the social media before it's published. That advisor is a co-owner of that social media account, and they work together to to publish some type of a message that is really bringing their content to the front line, letting know, letting people know that, that what they published and how to access it. Yep, that's all really great tips if you want to go down that social media road. And part of that, you know, the things they're posting, if it's on Instagram, most likely, maybe TikTok, if you really want to use what most kids are using now, at least as we're recording this, uh, but this could include Twitter and Facebook and everything else. Um, you're going to have images and video there. So a part of it is going to be the branding that goes along with publishing something for the world to see. So this ties in with their logo design and their episode art. You want to talk about, you know, developing a color scheme that they use consistently. There's a pretty cool website out there called coolers.co, C-O-O-L-O-R-S.co. Um, it does that. It gives you some a bunch of colors that match for for people like us that are not trained in doing this, and and you're gonna have a, a color scheme that looks good. Things like removing backgrounds from images. There's tons of ways to do that now. Um, if you're using Canva, like I recommended, that will remove image backgrounds now. Some of the other popular ones: remove.bg, slazer.com. The Noun Project has little icons that you can use, and even just Canva itself that will help you with all of this stuff. And um, and that'll get some of the, the branding out there, which I think is is really fun for the kids to sort of put that, you know, that that final finishing touch on their on their show, which is sharing it with the world. And speaking of final finishing touches, that's that's it. That was step seven. The marketing piece is probably the last thing you'll have to think about when it comes to your podcasting class and what the students are going to be doing. And I hope that wasn't too much for people. I know we've this we've addressed this, but there's a lot to think about. There's a lot of information. Um, if you were trying to take notes on what we've been saying, don't even worry about it. Head to the show notes. Head to gottech.com. Uh, pull up the show notes for episode 91, where you'll find a link to the guide that contains everything we just said in much, much more detail with lots of our thoughts and recommendations along the way my friend is there anything you want to add here to wrap up these seven steps yeah one of the biggest things that i want you to think about here is this can be a very long drawn out process but it doesn't have to be the great thing about a podcast is that it's supposed to be informal it's not supposed to be polished it's not supposed to be a book on tape it is supposed to be conversational very informal so make sure that we're not overthinking this a little bit and saying every little piece needs to be edited. Because if you do that, you're going to get a very choppy recording. You just want to take out the pieces that are very, very distracting. Everything else, leave it in. So when you really think about it, it could be so informal that you give them a question or if they just read a book, they have to give their own personal reflection. They record that. And then they take that recording and they up, upload that audio to wherever you want them to upload it. It does not need to be super complex like running a show for three and a half years every two weeks and making <laughs> sure that it's it's out there and all that. It doesn't need to be that. It could be super relaxed. Most of our podcasts that are on HVSPN.com right now, they come in, record when they have free time. They edit when they have free time. And we publish whenever it's ready. So don't think that you have to be on a schedule. These are just guidelines. These are things that we've tried and we found to be uh, tried and true. So just keep it very simple, especially when you're starting off. Have a couple of uh, assignments where they have to record audio and turn it in somehow. And then later on, build on that. It's no different than trying a new practice, such as a couple years ago, we went over Flip Classroom. Uh, one method of a flipped classroom uh, lesson. And we said, don't do this for every single lesson throughout the year. Just start with a unit or just start with one lesson and build on that. That's the same thing for podcasting. But what it does is it gives an avenue to students to let them be creative, have their own voice, have their own choice, and just have fun with their education. And it's going to stick with them a lot longer. So I'm going to piggyback on that and make this maybe our final 
comment here. Um, we we had somebody visit us this past year to talk about starting a podcasting class because we were doing it and he heard about it and wanted to come talk to us, see what we were doing. And in the conversation with this other teacher from another school district, we kind of got into how would you start off like say day one or the first week of a podcasting class. And I really want to emphasize to keep a course like this as student-centered and project-based as possible. And what I mean by that is don't fill up an entire marking period with teacher lecture where you're telling them about, say, podcasting history or popular podcasts that are out there and turning it into you talking to them to teach them about podcasting. I would say day one, day two, first week, get them in front of a microphone almost as quick as you possibly can. Get them experiencing what it is like to build that interest right away you know, t telling them about the history of podcasting, they might find that cool and you can find ways to sort of build that in throughout your course, I would say, but they most likely don't want to hear that at the beginning. Let them do what they came there to do, start recording stuff and start learning by doing instead of sort of listening to it. It's going to be way better for everybody and easier for you, I think, in the long run too. So that's, that's my final piece on, you know, building a podcasting class. So I guess that's going to wrap up this episode of Got Tech the Podcast. Do us some favors, subscribe to Got Tech the Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. We're pretty much on all of them. Uh, you can go to YouTube, check out our YouTube channel there and subscribe to that or hop over to some social media such as Twitter where you can find us at Nick Got Tech, at Geist Got Tech, or the show at We Got Tech. If you're going to start a podcast and you need any help, please reach out to us on the social medias. If you do create a podcast, please tag us. We'd love to take a look at them. And until next time, go out there and be a content creator. Have your students be content creators, and we hope to check out whatever it is that you make. Thanks for listening to Got Tech, the podcast. Remember to subscribe to our show and follow us at We Got Tech on Twitter so you can stay up to date with the latest episode releases, blog posts, product reviews, and PD announcements. You can also follow Geist and I individually at Geist Got Tech and at Nick Got Tech on Twitter or on Instagram at Nick Got Tech. Finally, remember to check out our website, gottech.com, where we post all our episodes, articles, and resources available to you for free. Until next time.